The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man, and that you teach the ways of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us, then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Soon we'll be celebrating World Mission Sunday, so if you have an extra dollar or two and would like to drop it in an envelope and send it to the church designated for the Universal Church, the World Mission Sunday Church, uh, please feel free to do that. A number of years ago, I knew a man who was quite wealthy. He was a very successful businessman and he had earned millions of dollars over the course of his life. And he told me one time that his very favorite Bible quotation was the one that you just heard in the gospel today, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. He told me that that was his favorite quote because it helped order everything in his life because he really did believe that uh, what you held in faith was something that was private. He did not believe in mixing the old with the new, the good with the bad, religion with business, faith with government. Those things were all separate in his mind. And what you held in faith was intended to be held in the secrecy of your own heart. And he believed that if you were a good Christian, you would never say anything that would upset anyone else. And I think that that is a misreading and a misunderstanding of what you and I are called to be as Christian people. We live in a world that has become increasingly more secular. There was a time in the history of Europe and the history of the New World, the United States, that people understood in a clear way what their Christian background was. It didn't mean that they were always the most devoted or the most uh, on fire Christians, but it meant that they understood in a clear way what was right and what was wrong and what Christ called us to live. That's no longer true today. Many people in our world look at our faith as a pious curiosity, a kind of superstition that really has very little to do whatsoever with life at all. That there are things that we believe that just don't jive with science or business or government and that what we hold in our hearts is one thing and how we mix those with other things in the world are other things. And again, I think that that's a gross misunderstanding of what we are called to be as Christians. In the gospel, it almost seems as if 
Christ were reinforcing that idea when he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things that belong to God, give them to God. First of all, he was calling the Pharisees uh, to look at their hypocrisy. He was putting them in their place saying, why are you arguing about something that is self-evident? Of course, if you live in a secular world, you owe something to the government that uh, leads and guides you. Yes, you need to pay taxes. Yes, you need to do those things that promote the common good uh, at the hands of your government. But the truth of it is, nothing really belongs to Caesar. Everything belongs to God. Even the coin that has Caesar's image is really not Caesar's. It was given to him by God. All of it belongs to the Lord. So we are called to live our faith in that way, that it touches every single aspect of our lives. Yesterday was the feast of St. Ignatius of Antioch. He was the second bishop of Antioch, replacing St. Peter, not St. Peter the Apostle, but St. Peter who was in the Roman canon. And he was a man who was filled with the love of Jesus Christ and he was unafraid to stand up and publicly announce to everyone what his relationship with Christ was all about. It was one of love. And he attracted other people, not promoted, attracted other people to come to the Lord. He was not afraid to stand up in front of the Romans and call them to task and say, that's not right and you should be doing it this way. He was not afraid to testify to his faith. He wasn't worried about whether this fit into the pot called government and this fit into the pot called personal conscience. It all was part and parcel of the same thing. He understood what it was to be a missionary disciple because he had to be. And he testified to his relationship with Christ. He testified to the truth of our faith in a time when to do so could cause you to lose your head. But that did not stop him. And eventually he was arrested and sentenced to death and he begged his followers, do not try to interfere with my martyrdom. My martyrdom will be the ultimate witness to my love for Christ, the ultimate witness to my desire to live as Christ calls me to live. You know, and that's how you and I are called to live today. We are living in, again, missionary times, and our bishop has reminded us that we are to be missionary disciples from womb to tomb, meaning that in all things, we demonstrate our relationship with Jesus Christ in a transparent and clear way so that others can see that relationship and be drawn to the Lord that we are unafraid to take a stand and proudly declare this is what our faith teaches and this is where we stand. We are called to be missionary disciples. And when I first read those letters of uh, St. Ignatius to his community when I was very young, I thought this is a hard life, a hard way to live yet it is the right way. There is no taking our leisure. There is no sitting back and resting on our laurels. There is the constant forward march that we take, attracting others to Jesus Christ by the way that we live. So oftentimes I look at my own self and say, how do I do that? How do I understand the will of God? Well, 
I understand what the will of God is in my life, most often by doing the next right thing that he has given me to do today. If I'm doing that next right thing, not only am I doing what God's will is, but I'm also doing what God reveals to me in prayer. I'm doing what God calls me to spread to other people, to attract them to him. Do the next right thing that comes your way today. How should I do that? Well, for me, I need to keep things simple. I need to go back to the basics. I need to go back to what I learned when I was a little tiny child about how to reflect the love of Christ by the way I treat other people. That I reflect Christ by the way I stand up for the truth. And last, how often am I called to do this? I am called to do this in all my affairs. I am called to bring this to bear in everything that I do, whether it's private or public or government or business, whatever it may be. I am called always to be that missionary disciple witnessing to Jesus Christ. So today, we look in our own lives and we render to God the things that are God's because everything is God's. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.